Okay, good evening. This is actually Tuesday night. It was my plan originally to have this out for you by tonight. This is the sixth lecture out of seven, but things didn't work out that way. And that means that you're going to be seeing this most likely on Tisha B'Av, which is tomorrow night. And um, not a problem with that, because the talk I'm going to be doing tonight is halachically a talk you can watch on Tisha B'Av, uh, sadly. So, we're doing now the series, I'm in the middle of the series, of seven parts called uh, Jews and Lithuanians, uh, Glory, Horror, and Revisionist History. This is lecture number six. The title of tonight's lecture is La Hashmid La Roga La Abed, Jews, Lithuanians, and Germans in 1941 to 1945. The sponsor tonight are my good friends Ari and Heather Elbaum. Uh, actually, it's in memory of people we're going to be speaking about tonight. The Lithuanian Jews murdered in the Holocaust. This would be Howard Elbaum's uh, aunts, I guess. Now, you don't see Howard Elbaum, but I do. Uh, when I put these together, it's not just me standing over here. It's my son, Yehuda Leib, who's uh, organizing everything. There's Howard Elbaum, who's a key player in the production of this series, and then there's Yossi Wedstein, who's truly a key player. So, tonight's talk, is, which you'll see on Tisha B'Av, is in memory of, of specific people in a broader sense as well. The specific people are the aunts of Howard Elbaum that he never met, Rocha and Nechama Chemerinsky and their families, murdered by the Germans and Lithuanians together with the rest of Antipol, with the town, in 1941, and also in memory of the uncle of Miss Elbaum, Heather Elbaum, Yassi Sus, Ben um, Shamsha and Ali, as they say. Now, without any further ado, I'm plunging my remarks, but I want to emphasize, I'll be speaking tonight, not in a broad sense about the Holocaust in Lithuania, because that's a mini-series by itself. To do justice to that topic, if you really want to know what happened, and I'm sure people don't, don't know, that's a five, six-part talk by itself. But I'm concentrating very specifically in this series on Jews and Lithuanians and how that played out in the terrible years of 1941 and 1944. And here we go. As I said last time, the 1930s, especially the second half of the 1930s, which would be 1935 to 1940, saw a deterioration of the Jewish situation in the Republic of Lithuania, a country which had experimented with democracy, as we saw, but which then slid, slid into right-wing nationalist xenophobic authoritarianism, although there definitely were Lithuanian liberals, and it's important to keep that in mind, this course was dominated by right-wing politicians and media. The message of the right-wing in those years was, this is our country, the Jews do not belong here, it was a mistake to let the Jews in in the past, and we want that mistake corrected. So this is the message that's getting out in the discourse in the second half of the 1930s in the Republic of Lithuania. What people have to understand is the dynamism of right-wing ideologies in the 1930s, which is something the public doesn't know today. It really had a... Uh, Elan to it, cachet. People thought fascism, broadly defined, was a good thing in terms of ordering a better society. It was believed sincerely that fascism in one form or another will, will make things better for the middle class, for the lower classes, get rid of class warfare, and promote the welfare of society in general. That's what they thought. Remember, Hitler called this thing, for example, National Socialism. Right? He calls it a, a kind of socialism, but only for Germans. And second of all, the other attraction of right-wing ideologies in those years, and perhaps after, was the promise of a paradise of an ethnically cleansed society. You won't see these people anymore. You won't see those people anymore. This is always the attraction of the extreme right. Now, I'm not talking about the conservative in America. Don't do that. That's uh, silly. I'm talking about the extreme. Right? Nazis, KKK, things like that. 
That's what they want. They say we'll have a better society and an ethnically cleansed, pure society. No Jews, no blacks, no this, no that, and the other. Now, I can't emphasize that this was an ideal. Okay, let's go to the next slide. People like Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco were looked up to as people to emulate because they were promoting, this was the perception, they were promoting this in their countries. They weren't looked at as bad people, they looked as good. These trends, of course, were exacerbated by the very rise in power and the radio power of the Third Reich, particularly the anti-Semitism part. The German radios constantly bombarded all Europe with anti-Semitic messages all the time. It was only the unwillingness of Lithuania in those years to totally alienate Western opinion that led the Lithuanian government to check the worst intentions of the right-wing parties. This is before the war. Part of the right-wing turn in Lithuania and other countries, because it happened all over Europe, all over Europe, almost no country was immune in Central Western Europe to switch to a right-wing dictatorship of one form or another, except for Czechoslovakia. Part of the right-wing turn was due to geography and to Lithuania's self-delusion, which is something I'm going to speak about tonight. The country has a bad geography. Let's go to the next one. You see Lithuania in the map there? On the left-hand side is a Germany. On the right-hand side was a hostile Poland. And beyond Poland was much bigger danger as Russia, Soviet Russia. So it's just in the wrong part of the world. And the Lithuanians thought that the USSR is a basic danger. But Germany was not. That's what they thought. Germany's not such a problem. We can live in a German-dominated Europe. The Stalinist state was clearly out to destroy the status quo in Lithuania. If the communists ever take over, they'll kill the middle class, literally. They'll liquidate the Lithuanian uh, culture, the Christianity, all the rest. It'll be terrible. They'll restore Russian imperialism, but of a more vicious sort, as we can see in the next slide, where Stalin was worse than the Tsar. The Tsar was not as totalitarian, and Stalin was an atheist. And so literally, Christianity which is very important in Lithuania by this time. Now, I know it's funny because they used to be pagans, but I'm talking about by now. Uh, it was extremely important. Germany, on the other hand, was different. It was believed. After all, in the previous war in World War I, the Germans had seemed willing, by the end of the war, to create an independent Lithuania as long as it had a German-born king who would Lithuanianize himself. He was going to take a, a Lithuanian name and all the rest of it. So, mutatis mutandis, Lithuania would not mind fitting into a German-organized Europe as long as Lithuania could retain its own culture, ethnicity, and all the rest of it. This is what they thought Hitler had in mind. Well, it is better than Stalin. You see, much better. Moreover, the Lithuanians read Mein Kampf, and Hitler was nuts about the Slavs. He wanted to wipe out or enslave the Slavs. Lithuanians are not Slavs. Language has nothing to do with Slavic. That's why it's so hard to understand. Right? They, they've been there... <laughs> so long as I tried to explain in my first lecture. They were there before the Slavs ever showed up. Okay? Poland is Slavic. Uh, Russia is Slavic. Ukrainians, Belarusians, you know, they are not Lithuanians. You see? So when Hitler says, I'm going to have to destroy the Slavs, which he writes in his Mein Kampf, <laughs> Lithuania said, well, it doesn't mean us. So between Russia versus Germany, Lithuania preferred Russia. Obviously, they preferred nobody. They would like to have their own independent country, but I showed you that map. It's not realistic. Now, as I said, and we shall see, the Lithuanians misunderstood Hitler and his plans. Now, let's go to the next map. There had been, right? There, there, let's go back to the previous one. That's what I was telling you. If you look at Mein Kampf, you'll see Hitler talking about his plans for the Slavs. Let's go to the next one. There had been one issue of uh, geography that was problematic, between the Republic of, of Lithuania and, and, and Germany. If you look on that map, you see where it says East Prussia and then Lithuania on the right-hand side? There's a small strip of territory called Memel, Memel territory. There was a town called Memel, which in Lithuania is called Klaipeda. And the important port city, and Lithuania grabbed it when Germany was defeated in World War I. It's a long, complicated story, but by the time it's over... Lithuania held Memel. Germany wanted it back, and Hitler in 1939 came and took it back. And Lithuanians didn't fight him. So, uh, 
that was a bone of contention. But other than that, and once Hitler took that back, there should be no more territorial issues between Lithuania and Germany. The Germans are on their side, Lithuanians are on their side, and that's how Lithuanians hoped. So if you were Jewish in Lithuania in the late 1930s, the trends were not good. The Father Coglins, if I can call him that, the radio guys, the media people, were spewing out every day, day and night, anti-Semitic speeches. Really were disturbing. There was an occasional beating up of Jews, or Jews. But for the most part, life was okay. It still was law and order, basically. The Jews were still, in Lithuania, very proud of their unique identity. Uh, they had no idea what's coming. And they even, by the way, organized the Lithuanian boycott of German goods. And they said, Hitler's next door. He's uh, persecuting the Jews in Germany. Uh, we'll show him. We won't buy anything from Germany. And those, they had that kind of Jewish solidarity. And then came 1939, which changed everything. Now, let's go to the next one. In order to understand what happened, you have to remember, Hitler came to power in 1933. And between 1933 and 1939, he won a bunch of gambles, like a poker player, uh, in which he had bloodless conquests. He, he frightened or bluffed everybody. So on the left-hand side of that map, he was able to take over the Rhineland and militarize in 1936, and nobody stopped him, even though it was against the Versailles Treaty. Then, two years later, he took over the whole Austria and added to Germany, and nobody stopped him. And then a few months later, he took over the Sudetenland, and nobody stopped him. This is the famous Munich Conference that we all are so horrified about, Chamberlain. And then he took over the rest of Czechoslovakia. If you look at that map, what he called Bohemia Moravia, he just invaded, took it over in March 1939. And the Slovakia part became a puppet state of Germany. And nobody stopped him. So this was, use modern terminology, this was God feeding uh, the uh, addiction of the gambler. So if I gamble, and I bet the whole everything I have, and I win the first time, I win the second time, I win the third, I bet everything. Because he was ready to go to war each time. I bet it every time, and I win, then you know, you've you got an addict on your hands. And so what happened afterwards was, by 1939, after he took over Czechoslovakia and got away with it, so now, this is how I went Danzig. If you look in the upper right-hand corner over there, you can see Germany's like broken into two parts. It's called the Polish Corridor. That's right. And you see East Prussia, that's part of Germany, and then the other side was the rest of Germany. And Hitler said, oh, terrible. Now, Germany's broken into two parts, and I want Danzig. The majority of the population there is German anyway, which was true. Then I want it. So I demand that Poland give it back to me. And he thought he could bluff his way into forcing the Poles to give it up without fighting. By this time, this is basic European history. England and France had woken up. And they said, you know, he promised us that Austria was the last time. Then he promised that England was the last time. Then he promised us that uh, Bohemia was the last time. So he's a liar. So from now on, we kind of how about we don't believe him? And they said, if you take Danzig, I will go to war. He thought they're bluffing, and that's how World War II started. That's what happened. He, you know, he gambled, and, and, and it didn't work. Now, specifically, Hitler realized that Poland is not going to give in because Poland being supported by England and France, and they weren't the type to give in to his bluffs. So he said, the heck with it. I'll fight him, I'll conquer him. But in order to do that, Poland might be backed by Russia. And anyway... Hitler didn't want a situation where if he goes to war against Poland, he'll have a two-front war. Fight the British and the French on the left-hand side, and the Russians and the Poles on the right-hand side, like happened in World War I. And anyway, he figured, if Russia will be on his side, if he can make a deal with Russia, then Britain and France won't even go to war in the first place. These were his cheshbonas. And so as a result, without going into too many details, uh, Hitler made a deal with Stalin, even though they hated each other. One was leader of the Nazis, one leader of the communists. But it turns out two dictators have what to talk about. And let's go to the next one. They simply said, tell you what, Hitler said, I'm going to invade Poland. I'll take over half the country. You take over the other half of the country, as you see on the right-hand side. Look at the two maps, one on the left and one on the right. And you see how they divide it up. So Hitler got a big chalik. Stalin also got a big chalik. Hitler fought. Stalin didn't have to fight. He was so clever, he just let Hitler finish out the polls. Then he came to grab his part. Which brought Russia, if you look at the map on the left, up to the border of Lithuania. Didn't have it before, correct? 
right? Until in the 1920s and 30s, Lithuania had no border with Russia, which is good. In the middle was that finger of Poland, which was the disputed territory of Vilna. But now things are changing, okay? This created a new reality, and it led, this is what we call the start of World War II. Now, um, Poland was overrun in one month, uh, and let's put it this way. What does this have to do with Lithuania? Let's go to the next slide. Part of the deal that was made secretly between Hitler and Stalin was that we're not only going to divide Poland, but we're also going to divide the other territories in terms of spheres of influence. In other words, which area is under the Rishus of Hitler and which area is under the Rishus of Stalin? And the deal that was made, Hitler gave Stalin the three countries of the Baltic, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. He basically said, they're under your Rishus. What you do to them, I will not interfere. And what I do to the territory in my possession, you won't interfere. That's the bloody deal that they made. And therefore, Lithuania, although they didn't realize it, was now in the Stalin zone. Okay? And uh, they didn't realize it when the war started in September 1939, when Hitler invaded Poland. He had the chutzpah to say that Poland attacked him. Listen, Wayne, Lafayette, Stone, and said, we're neutral. We don't want to be part of the war. We're out of it. They didn't know that by that time they had already been delivered by Hitler into the hands of Stalin. But they were about to find out. England and France are far away. Right? But now they're at war with Hitler. But they are not at war with Stalin. Uh, you follow that? Even though Stalin and Hitler divided Germany, I mean Poland up, but Stalin did it in such a sneaky way that England and France did not declare war on him, but they declared war on Hitler. And once they declared war on Hitler, you and I know they never gave up until 1945 when they wiped him out. But nobody could foresee that at the time. Now keep in mind, all during this time, Hitler was intending to attack Stalin at a later date. It wasn't a real uh, alliance like that, right? And by the way, Stalin was also planning to attack Hitler in that date. Here, let's take the next line. One of the most famous cartoonists of World War II, very famous, David Lowe, who happened to be a Jew from New Zealand. Isn't that interesting? Uh, he has brilliant car political cartoons. And here you see Hitler and Stalin standing over the dead Poland. And what is Hitler saying? Oh, the scum of the earth, how do you do? And Stalin said, the bloody assassination of the workers, I presume? Meaning, each one had accused the other of being, uh, you know, anti-workers. Uh, 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 That's what the Russia said about Hitler. And Hitler said, oh, you're a scum of the earth. You know, the Bolshevik uh, you know, barbarism. But it turned out that they could do business. But what does it really mean? It was a completely cynical um, arrangement. And each one was planning, the way crooks do, that when the time is right, to break the treaty and attack each other. As you and I know, Hitler beat Stalin to the punch. That's all that happened. Otherwise, Stalin would have done it. Now, here we are in October of 1939. Hitler just took over Poland and Stalin joined him and split it. And now Stalin goes to Lithuania and he says, I request from you, <laughs> I request from you that you allow 50,000 Soviet soldiers, respectfully, to uh, be garrisoned in Lithuania because now that's my border with Hitler. Uh, in exchange, by the way, I'll make it worth your while. I'll give you Vilna. You know that territory that they took away from you? Let's go to the next slide. See over there where it says Republic of Central Lithuania? That's the territory of Vilna, which was part of Poland, as I discussed earlier. That's why Poland and Lithuania hated each other. Stalin said, I will give you that whole piece so you'll get your beloved Vilna back plus the territory around Vilna. In return, you'll have an alliance with me, with Stalin, and as a friendship, you'll allow me to garrison 50,000 Russian soldiers against the German border. What could Lithuania say? Uh, they'd been handed, you know, they couldn't go to Hitler. Hitler said, well, I made a deal the under the Rishos of Stalin. And so, very nervously, the Lithuanians took over Vilna and all the territories around Vilna, where the rest of the Litvish Jews lived. Okay? This territory would include Vilna and Svensson and, I don't know, maybe Rodden, I don't know, you know, all those type of lands, pieces of what we call today Belarus, and a big Jewish population. Uh, they took over these territories, but they knew that sooner or later Stalin's going to pounce on them and take over the whole country. 
And so the famous line, as you see at the bottom, was Vilnius Musu Alitava Russo. The Vilna is now ours, the Lithuanian said, but Lithuanian is now Russians. So now for the next six months, he had a very weird situation. For eight months. From October or so of 39 to June of 40, Lithuania was enlarged and had Vilna. It was neutral. It was not part of the war. Stalin did not take over the country. He just had a large army there. They paid, like Moses said to the king of Edna, we'll pay for the food, pay for everything. They behaved correctly. They were, you know, not interfering in Lithuanian uh, life, which is garrisoned over there, take over the airfields. Um, and things will go on as they are until now. You can still run your own Lithuanian country. And uh, this was very significant Jewishly because the Jews, for example, in that part of Poland, they saw the German army coming. They saw the Russian army coming. Neither was good. Those who could fled to Vilna. The Jewish population in Vilna, I'm talking about the Vilna and the suburbs, 100,000. 100,000. The refugees, 50,000. So overnight, in October, November of 1939, the population of the Republic of Lithuania went from 150,000 Jews to 300,000. Those doubled. And this in a country where the right-wing parties in Lithuania have been claiming there are too many Jews already, and now just doubled. And the country is now flooded with Polish Jews, meaning Jews running away from the front lines, fleeing the horrors of Hitler and Stalin. This is the famous era when the Lithuanian yeshivas, now I use the word Lithuanian in the Litvish sense, Lithuanian yeshivas that were not in the Republic of Lithuania, but were in the Republic of Poland. I'm talking about Mir, Kamenets, Baranovich, Rodin, places like that, right? Brodno, places like that. Famous, quote-unquote, Litvish yeshivas, but which were located in the place called the Republic of Poland. The Republic of Poland no longer exists. And they're running to the Lithuania part because it's a neutral country. Their hope is they can sit out the war. Right? The war will rage in Europe. Hopefully, Lithuania will not be part of it. It's like being, for example, Switzerland. The hope was. And uh, when the war's over, you know, it gets a Ganeza. That was the hope. Now, that was stupid, but, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. It's stupid to imagine Lithuania would survive as an island of neutrality in World War II, but that was the hope. And so the country is flooded, among other things, as you see in the next the slide, with all the big rabbis. Of Chaim Meiser, Gersensky in the center of there, of course, was, was in Vilna beforehand. But now... If you see on the left hand side of Baruch Bear Leibowitz, comes with his issue from Kamenitz and the boys who can flee. Pchanan Wasserman on the right with Baranovich. Baron Cutler, who, this is an older picture, uh, brings his issue of Kletsk uh, to Vilna area. Uh, Laser Yuda Finkel at the lower end of the side brings a Miri Yeshiva there. And the job of Chaim Meiser in October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June is to hopefully absorb these yeshivas and find places for them to relocate inside the Republic of Lithuania. Okay? Now, therefore, next nine months, Lithuanian Jews live in what I call an anxious bubble. They were terrified in case things should change, but right now it was good for a few months. Because it wasn't Germany, it wasn't Russia, it wasn't occupied by any of these armies. The Lithuanians were scared enough that they weren't bothering the Jews at that particular moment because they are scared out of their mind. The Lithuanian government was even hoping that the Jews will somehow or other be able to appeal to the West, particularly America. The Lithuanian government gave a visa to the Panovich Arov, and they said, you have a lot of people you know on the outside. Go out of Lithuania as a diplomat for us and plead for help for Lithuania from the West. Because you're Jewish and you have a lot of Jewish contacts, they thought, and you know, maybe you'll be able to do something. That is how the Panovich Arov survived the Holocaust. He had a Lithuanian diplomatic passport, Lithuania at this time was still a neutral country. He traveled through Nazi Germany, the Panovich Arab, because you see, all you have to do is cross over the border. At that time, if you, even if you're Jewish, even if you're Rosh Hashiva, if you have a foreign passport, you're, you're a citizen of a neutral country, Germany is very law-abiding in that regard. He stayed in Berlin and these other places until he left and eventually made it to Palestine. Uh, the rest of his family was killed. That's how he survived. So I'm just trying to tell you, it's a crazy nine months of what I call anxious bubble. Now, um, for now, the country had 50,000 Russian soldiers in there. But I'll tell you again, what it means is, like in Baltimore, for example, 
you have what the fifth regiment army or something like that. You know, they they're in their uh, army camps. They're not bothering anybody. And frankly, uh, the Lithuanians loathe the Soviet presence. The Jews they, they can't say so because that'll give Stalin an excuse to attack take over Lithuania. The Jews in Lithuania are ambivalent. On the one hand, the Russians are a lot of customers. They do pay. At this time, they paid money for what they take. It's an economic bonanza for the Jews. If you have a store like my father did or other Jews, and now all of a sudden there's Russian soldiers on weekends that they have uh, you know, pay to spend, it's a big economic bonanza. And on the other hand, the Russians bought everything in sight because Stalin said that the Soviet Union was a worker's paradise and they live on a better scale than anybody else. But of course, they were starving to death in Russia, and they had no shoes, and they had no nothing. And now they come to a country like Lithuania, which is a Western country. They go to a store, basically it's like going to a supermarket, like Seven Mile Market in Baltimore, and say, all this food, I'm buying it all, you know, whatever I can take home. Oh, there are shoes. I'm buying shoes, whether they fit or not. Oh, there are handkerchiefs. There's, you know, everything that people take for granted in the West. They didn't. Everyone is aware during this period of nine months, that Lithuania is living under a sort of Damocles. And indeed, the fate of this country is going to be a function of high politics, raw, real politics. You see, and I'll explain this very shortly, Stalin, let's go to the next one, had figured that the Second World War would play out in a certain way, which it did not. He figured the Second World, would be, World War would be something of a repeat of the First World War. And so what would happen would be, he hoped, that just like in the First World War, from 1914 to 1918, A killed B and B killed A, the Germans fought the British and French, and vice versa, and they bled each other to death, like in that movie, All Quiet in the Western Front. And Stalin figured, good, let the Germans and the British and French fight each other and have big casualties, and then when everybody's wiped out and exhausted, I'll move in and take over Europe. That was the plan. It's the oldest type of politics in the world. Get your two enemies to fight and then you take over. Simple as that, right? Now, um, but what upset his calculations was, it did not work like, like, like that. Hitler also knew about the First World War, and he had planned the Blitzkrieg so that there wouldn't be a repeat of what I just described. And in a single month, in May of 1940, Hitler overran and conquered France. May and early June of 1940. Uh, so there was no Western Front. All of a sudden, uh, Stalin is in real danger. The USSR is in real danger. Because you have a big, powerful German army. They now add France to their conquest. They take the uh, assets of France. And now Hitler can turn east. Now, at that particular moment, I don't want to get on a tangent, Hitler thought that England will give in. And this didn't work out because Churchill took over, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in the big picture, the defeat of France released the German army from worrying about the Western Front, there was nobody there. America was not in the war. Now, Hitler could concentrate on spending the next 12 months from June of 40 to June of 41 planning to attack Stalin, which he did. Okay? So, Stalin had to take countermeasures. The day France surrendered, Stalin immediately annexed Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia and proceeded to ruthlessly communize it. Notice he said, wait a minute, we might have trouble with Hitler. I need to consolidate my base. I have these three little countries over here who could provide a way for Hitler to get in and attack Russia. And so he immediately told his troops, you know, who were sitting in the country politely, don't be polite anymore, take over the country. There was a coup. The Russian army flooded in the country. What could you do? The Lithuanians are a small country. They engineered very cynically that the Lithuanians, the Latvians, the Estonians, should switch governments from A to B. Instead of having the regular prime minister and all that, you have a bunch of communists. The first thing the communists did was fly to Moscow. It was all prearranged. And we begged Stalin, please allow us to join the Soviet Union as constituent republics. Do us this chesed. Stalin said, okay, I agree. Therefore, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia voluntarily you know, became part of the Soviet Union. That means they have no identity of their own. And then Stalin sent in not only the army, but the secret police, they started killing and arresting everybody. It could be the slightest uh, danger to Russia. And this in the Stalinist mentality. And then all hell descended upon Lithuania. Right? Suddenly the country lost its independence. 
was flooded with Soviet troops and with the NKVD, the secret police. Suddenly, Lithuanian patriotism, overnight, was a political, to be a Lithuanian patriot, which had been the way everybody was until then, is their country. Suddenly, Lithuanian patriotism was a political crime because you're supposed to be a Soviet patriot. Religion was a crime, and being bourgeois, middle class, owning a store, something like that, was a crime. Churches, synagogues, all religious institutions, schools, ruthlessly shut down. All institutions, I mean all institutions, were Sovietized. Thousands disappeared in the middle of the night. That's the Stalin way. You don't have any day by day, uh, daylight suppression. You wait till the middle of the night and then these guys come up with these uh, trucks and they have a list. And you go to prison, prison, by the time you wake up in the morning, it's all gone. And uh, they were sent to the Gulag, never to return. Indeed, in a single week, in June of 41, just before Hitler attacked, in a week, Stalin deported 30,000 Lithuanians. That's out of a population of 2 million. And uh, there are many others. In addition, Stalin started moving Russians to settle in Lithuania. What does that mean? We're going to Russianize this place so the Lithuanians will be a minority in their own country. It's a nightmare if you're a Lithuanian. No, it was, it was the full Stalinist nightmare. And Lithuanians react and remember this with horror down to the present day. And I understand totally why. Because they had a great thing going, and all of a sudden, it just turned into the blackest nightmare. And as I said, for anyone who had the slightest objection to this, was killed or sent to Siberia or something like that, put in these wagons, them and their children with no food, and they died on the way. I mean, there's all these horror stories, because we're dealing with Stalin over here. I might remind you, Stalin killed many more people than Hitler, because he had a lot more time. <laughs> Hitler was in only for a few years, 10 years, 12 years. Stalin was in for 25 years, something like that. No, about 25 years, maybe 30 years. So, you know, this is what we're dealing with. The Lithuanians, except for the few who were communists, very few, were seething with rage. 40,000 Lithuanians flee into Germany. And they pledge to return and to liberate the country and to punish the bad guys. Who are the bad guys? Now comes a controversial issue. The Jews are going to be among the bad guys. Why? They're going to say, like this. The Jews are all communists. They betrayed Lithuania. Is that true? Were the Litvish Jews communists? I mean, a few are. A few Gaim too. Right? A few Lithuanians also. Not many. So a few Jews and a few Lithuanians. There were some. But Rove, the vast majority of the Jews in Lithuania, we've talked about the Zionists, Bundists, Agoda Mizrahi. This is who the vast majority of Lithuanian Jews were. They had nothing to do with communism whatsoever. They weren't interested in it. Right? A few were. Did the Jews betray Lithuania? The Jews? Now you tell me, this guy was a Jewish communist and he helped Stalin. And this guy was a Jewish communist and Stalin. What's that got to do with me? In other words, you understand what I'm saying. Uh, did they welcome the Soviet invaders and constitute a fifth column? The Russian army had already been there, 50,000, and then came another 250,000. First of all, there were some Jews, as I said before, who were communists. Let's go to the next one. Here you have the classic problem of anti-Semitism. We say, call Yisrael, or Rebim Zelazel, all Jews are responsible for one another. What does that mean? Call Yisrael, or Rebim Zelazel, what does that mean? You give a positive meaning, you give a definite, de negative meaning. Positively, it means all Jews are responsible for one another. I have to give charity and help a poor Jew out, even though I don't know him. Call Yisrael Rebim Zelazel. I get that. There's also a negative meaning. Every Jew is held responsible for any action committed by any other Jew. Really? So if the Jew in Minneapolis who robs a bank, a Jew, is my, I'm responsible, you're going to punish me? You get it? You don't do that with you. If some Lithuanian or some American or whatever, somebody's not Jewish, commits a crime, you say like this. The criminal should be published, punished, and the people not criminals should not be punished. Because they don't help them. But it's classic anti-Semitism that you... Do what I just said. If one Jew did it, or a hundred Jews did it, then all the million Jews are responsible for this. This is how Hitler operated. This is how Henry Ford operated. That's how every anti-Semite in the world has operated. And um, there's no answer to this. Meaning, you don't go by logic. Logically, it's a baloney. I'm not responsible for what somebody else did. I'm responsible for what I did. To a lesser degree, I may be responsible for what my kids do, possibly. You know, my, my spouse. That's it. 
That's it. I'm not responsible for, and legally I'm not even responsible for that. That's it. I'm not responsible for what anybody else did. Yes, you are. Why? Because you're all part of the tribe. So this is the anti-Semitism in its full manifestation. And the Lithuanians were saying this day and night. So, there are some Jews that are communists, but the vast minority not. No, all the Jews are communists. They're all held responsible because some of the communist Jews betrayed Lithuania. So did some of the communist non-Jews. No, that's different. The Jews are the ones that count. Secondly, everybody knew, as I said before, the Jews themselves suffered under Stalin. He targeted the religious and arrested them and destroyed them. The Zionists, he arrested them, destroyed them. The Bundists, Bundists were Marxists, but not the Soviet way. And the Soviets hate anybody who's a Marxist, not their way, more than they hate anyone else, if you know how that works. And so they were persecuted, they were arrested, they were killed, their institutions were closed. They were sent to the Gulag. Many famous rabbis, by the way, I don't know if you know this, died in Stalin's prison camps. I'm just off the top of my head, I remember David Rappaport, you know, there are many. Died in Stalin's, you know, in, in the Gulag. You understand? Know it wasn't Hitler. He died. Uh, but the perception was out there. I think, my own opinion, this is probably due to the fact that when the Soviet army came in, the Jews, as a minority, tried to kiss up to them as a matter of classic survival tactics that were age old. You're Jewish. You're a minority. All these countries in Europe are conquered at one time or another by different people. Take, for example, Lithuania. It was the Lithuanians, and then with the Russians, and then with the Germans in World War I, and then the other Lithuanians. Now it's Stalin, and who knows what it'll be tomorrow. So if you're a minority, like the Jews, what do you do? You try to get along with everyone in power. What am I supposed to do? Get killed because I'm going to be a uh, uh, lord to Lithuania and the, and the Russians will kill me? It's just a natural, it's not I'm doing anything against anybody else. I'm just trying to survive. You are too. You're doing the same thing. In my own family case, uh, my father lived in Shavuot, which was in Lithuania, Shavuot, they call it, and, uh, which was one of the larger communities. And uh, we had a number of stores. And uh, the Russians came in, and immediately all the stores were nationalized, you know, taken over by the government. But what did my father do? You have to think on your feet. And so he went to the Russian guy and he said like this, the store belongs now to Stalin, but you need somebody who knows how to manage the store, and I know how the goods and the things are. So put me in charge of the store under, under Stalin. You know what I mean? In other words, I'll do the same thing I did before, and just now I'm a government employee. And they did. Does that make him a traitor to Lithuania? The store is taking over. He's trying to survive. He's otherwise starving on the street. He had a big house because he was well-to-do. The Russian army came in a bunch of um, trucks and jeeps. They start requisitioning houses, kicking people out. He immediately went to a major, because I'm not going to speak Russian, he's born in Russia. And he said to the major, you move in my house, because that way the other soldiers won't buy. And, you know, uh, you'll live in my house, because we have a lot of room. And the guy did so. So it was a major and his wife. And they live in the house. And anytime any other Russian soldiers wanted to come in, the major would kick him out. He said, this is my house. And the wife, by the way, was a, a peasant girl from uh, the collective farm. So she didn't know what it is to be lazy. So she ended up being like a maid. And she couldn't help herself. She wanted to clean and this, that, and the other. I'm just trying to say, in a classic case of trying to accommodate to the new realities and survive in, in, in a new regime. Does that make him a traitor to Lithuania? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Now, it's also true that the Jews realized, as bad as Stalin is, and Stalin was bad, my father's uh, neighbors and uh, relatives, a week before Hitler showed up, were among the 30,000 that were arrested by the NKVD and shipped off to Siberia, and everybody was crying when they left. Turns out they were lucky because they weren't caught by Hitler, you understand? But many of them died in Siberia. So it was a terrible time and a terrible place to be. But if you're Jewish, you say like this, as bad as Stalin is, Hitler's worse. Hitler's going to kill everybody. Correctly or not, it became part of Lithuanian consciousness that the Jews welcomed Stalin and helped them thereby, thereby betraying their country and demonstrating that they were not really Lithuanians, even though these Lithuanians could see with their very eyes that Stalin physically liquidated Judaism 
and Jewish culture. That's the main thing. Make they see what they want to see. Okay? Uh, it certainly didn't matter because much of the Lithuanian reaction in 1940, 41, because Stalin took over in June 40, uh, to the Soviet uh, invasion, came from the Lithuanians who had fled to Germany. So they were in Nazi Germany in 1940-41. And all the narratives there are anti-Semitic. Let's go to the next one. The main Lithuanian leader was this guy, Kazuskerpa, who had been the Lithuanian ambassador to Germany. He flees when Stalin takes over the country. He runs to Hitler, to uh, Germany. And he organizes a, a Lithuanian activist front. It was called Big Organization. And naturally, you know, he's a friend of Goebbels and all these others. And the narrative is one in which we're fighting the Jews. Get it? The Jews have betrayed the country, handed over. Stalin himself is a tool of the Jews in some fashion. Uh, all kind of theories like that. This is Nazism. And the Lithuanians therefore identify their cause with the Nazi ideology. The next 12 months, as I said, were fateful. Because from June of 40 to June of 41... When Lithuania was occupied by Stalin, two parallel events took, were taking place in Germany, which is, after all, as I told you before, you see in the next slide, is the country next door to Germany. If you see where Germany is on that map, which you do, you see right adjacent to it, in the upper left-hand side, I suppose, is Lithuania. So it's right next to it. It's weird. You're occupied by Stalin, but a few miles away is Hitler. Now, what was happening here? Each of these two developments would have a powerful effect on the Jews of Lithuania. The first was a Lithuanian development. The second was a German development. The Lithuanian development was involving the Lithuanians who had escaped to Germany, 40,000, staying in contact with their fellow countrymen in occupied Lithuania, setting up a secret organization called the Lithuanian Activist Front, the LAF, with the purpose of driving the Russians out and liberating their country. The headquarters, as you saw, was in Nazi Germany. But branches were formed throughout Lithuania. So you're talking about July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. In Lithuania, little by little, even though the NKVD is there and Stalin's secret police is everywhere, they're forming, you know, anti-Russia societies and planning one day to kick the Russians out. Now, obviously, they can't kick them out by themselves, but, you know, together with a German invasion. They didn't know exactly when and where, but they knew, they figured they could count on this, and they could. So this is a Lithuanian development. Separate from this, right, you understand what I'm saying? Separate from this, Hitler was amassing secretly a gigantic army in the east for a surprise attack on Stalin. Incredibly, it worked. Stalin had the best spy system in the world. The spies told him well ahead of time that Hitler was going to make a surprise attack on him. He just didn't believe him. It's one of the famous espionage stories, okay? So this means that for over 12 months, from June to June, from June of 40 to June of 41, the Lithuanians were preparing to somehow conquer Lithuania from the Russians, and the Germans were too. The Lithuanians told the Germans about their plans, assuming that once the Russians were driven out, Hitler would allow Lithuanian independence, with Lithuanians ruling their own country, allied to Germany, just as was the case in many other countries in Europe at the time. Look at the next map. In World War II... There were a number of countries that were, you know, functioning and independent. And they were sincerely allied to Hitler. Hungary, as you see in the map. Romania. Bulgaria. Okay? Italy, of course. Um, these were countries that ran their own show. Uh, weren't occupied by Hitler. I repeat, were not occupied by Hitler. Hungary only in 44. They sent soldiers to help Hitler's armies. They did economic deals with him and things like that. They were pro-Hitler. They had official anti-Semitic policies. And Slovakia is there. And they were happy, if I can use that terminology. Because they figured it's better than being under Stalin. So Lithuania said, well, Lithuania will be like that. Right? You see Lithuania in that map. We'll be one of those countries which is allied to Hitler, sincerely. And we'll try to fit into the German economic plans and things like that. And uh, we'll be an actual honest ally of Germany against Russia. And everybody will be happy. Now, um, in this, the Lithuanians were mistaken. Hitler in the east, and you see in the map, 
that part towards the, the light part towards the right between Germany and Russia, that huge area, Hitler in the east had no such intentions. Indeed, he planned this as his famous Lebensraum, living room. Basically, he said that whole area will be killed out of everybody and the and Germans will move in and settle there like the Americans did on the, on, on the prairie. You understand? The local population will be gotten rid of or enslaved and uh, this will be part of greater Germany. So, in Hitler's mind, there's a difference between South Eastern Europe, which are those three countries you see over there, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, they, for now, can be allowed to have their own existence, versus the countries to the right or to the east of Hitler, in which his plan was to um, not much annihilate them like the Americans killed the Indians. That's how he talked. Like the Americans killed the Indians. And, and, and then, then Germans will move in and settle it as a brave new frontier. The Lithuanians did not know this. Right? And cynically, Hitler did not tell this to the Lithuanians. So all during 1940 and 41, the Lithuanian groups prepared for liberation and independence along fascist lines. They thought in extreme right-wing nationalist terms. One of the they had many items on their agenda. I do agree yours not the country and so forth. One of the items on their agenda that they were planning when the day comes that they take over their own country, one of the items for the agenda for the new Lithuania was the Jews. The new Lithuania would have no Jews. They actually issued public announcements months before to this very effect, right? When they were still in Germany. Notice these are official um, bulletins by the Lithuanian liberation societies where they say when we take over, they say as follows, leaflet number 37, the, the crucial day of reckoning has come for the Jews at last. This is what they're writing. And sending out in pamphlets and leaflets all over the place. Lithuania must be liberated not only from the Asiatic Bolshevik slavery, but also from the long-standing Jewish yoke. In the name of Lithuanian people, we solemnly declare that the ancient right of sanctuary granted to the Jews in Lithuania by Vytotas the Great back in the 1300s is now abolished forever and without reservation. So in other words, you have no longer right to live here. Jews who are guilty of persecuting Lithuanians will be brought to trial. Those who manage to escape will be found. It's the duty of all honest Lithuanians to take measures by their own initiative to stop such Jews and punish them. The new Lithuanian state will be rebuilt by Lithuanians only. All Jews are excluded from Lithuania forever. Let the Jews know that this irrevocable sentence has been passed upon them. Not a single Jew will have citizenship rights. The errors of the past and the evils perpetrated by the Jews will be set aright and a firm foundation for a happy future. And the creative work of our Aryan nation Lithuanians actually are Aryans, <laughs> more than the Germans, will be laid. Let us prepare for the na liberation of Lithuania and the purification of the nation. So, if you were Jewish, I mean, you said, I guess, why don't you get the heck out of there? I mean, I, I, I realize that in hindsight, but I just want you to know, they get fair warning. Now, um, theoretically, this could mean that all Jews would be kicked out of Lithuania. You know, like in 1495. In reality, though, it meant killing them. Or killing enough to scare the others to flee the country. That's what they thought. But in the end, none of this mattered. None of this mattered. Because on June 22, 1941, let's go to the next map. Hitler launched his gigantic Operation Barbarossa, a gigantic invasion. I want you to look at that map. The front, there's a big attack on Russia from the Baltic Sea in the upper left-hand side to the Black Sea in the lower right-hand side. All across Europe was one long attack line. Okay? It's amazing. On a, on a gargantuan scale. Now, pay, cl pay close attention. I'm not doing a lecture on the Holocaust in Lithuania, which is a huge topic. I'm doing a talk about Lithuanians and Jews in the Holocaust. Or at least I'm touching on parts of it. The faithful week for us was this last week in June when the war started. Two things you have to hold cup. Two things happened simultaneously, A and B. A, there was a military attack by the German army on the Russian forces located in Lithuania. Let's go to the next slide. There you see Lithuania, and you see those arrows. That's the German army doing its thing, invading from Germany in Lithuania and beating the Russians and, and, and crushing them, chasing them out. With the Russians fighting back but losing to superior German forces. That's a military campaign that took place 
in late June of 41. At the same time, the Lithuanians, directed by that organization, the LAF, launched an uprising on their own against the Russian occupiers. So this was a national liberation uprising, of course in coordination with the German war. Ordinarily, the Red Army, the Russian army, could crush the Lithuanian you know, uh, freedom fighters, if you want to call them that. But the Red Army was being hit at this time by the Germans, by the German invasion. And so the Lithuanian uprising succeeded all over the country and on their own, before the Germans even showed up. All throughout the country, as had been planned, the Lithuanians would rise and kick the Russians out or kill them and take over Kovna, Vilna, Tels, Shavl, one town after another. And they saw this as a great uh, national uprising of liberation. For around one week or so, this is June 22 to June 30, you know, something like that, of 41, the Lithuanians were in charge of their own country before the Germans took over. Although everywhere, wherever the German army showed up, they were greeted by the Lithuanians as liberators in the same way Le Havdo, that the French greeted the GIs of General Patton's army when they liberated France in 1944. Because from the Lithuanian perspective, they thought the Germans were coming in, they're going to kick Stalin out, and then leave the Lithuanians their own country. So it was Givaldi. Meanwhile, during that week or so, I say June 22 to June 30, give it another few days, listen very closely. During that week, all over Lithuania, Lithuanians started going around and killing and torturing the Jews everywhere, often in Chmelnitsky ways. In 150 small towns, and here's uh, Howard Elbaum's relatives, in 150 small towns, the Lithuanians killed every Jew in the town and the village. You know what I said? So it's not the Germans yet. The Germans were around the corner. They weren't there yet. Listen to this description. On June 25, Lithuanian partisans, that's the LAF, who defined themselves as freedom fighters, began a three-day killing rampage against Jews in smaller towns and villages, during which the entire populations of 150 Jewish communities perished. That means you go town to town, and people get together, planning before, and you round up to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 Jewish families, and you kill them. Some Jews were driven in their, from their homes and burned alive, after having been savagely beaten and herded into synagogue schools and public places that were then torched. So simultaneously, spontaneously, all over the country, the local few Jews, including the old people, the young people, this, that, and the other, especially in small communities, there's only a few Jews anyway, like I say, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 Jewish families, something like that. Just get them all, you whack them over the head, you chop them in axes, you push them into a building, usually a shoal, you burn the shoal down and everybody dies from that way. In other instances, entire Jewish families were driven to nearby forests or riverbeds where pits or trenches had been prepared and, they, and were then shot. It's before Hitler showed up, you hear what I'm saying? In several places like Renai and Gerolai in the Tells area and in Meritz and Plungian and other places, Shaki and Kelm, Jews were forced to dig their own graves. By the Lithuanians, the Germans had not shown up yet. Virtually all the Jews in Vilkomir were herded into the shoal and burned alive. The Germans had not shown up yet. In Serii, the Jews were dragged naked through the streets and then brutally murdered in the presence of a cheering crowd. Think about that. In Panovich, Jews, including several young women were, who had been raped, were hurled into burning lime. In Kovna, there was a, well, that's a separate thing. So before anything else, so this is my point. The, uh, all of a sudden, everything turned savage. The wrong week to be. In many of these little locations that you see, these little rinky-dinky towns on the map in front of you at the moment, were Jewish communities. They're all over the place. Most of them were small. They're scattered everywhere. They're killed by the neighbors. And as you see, in incredibly brutal ways. One directed by the SS. This is before the Einsatzgruppen showed up. Before anything else, those things did it on their own as part of the campaign. Now, what about a big city? It's not so easy to get. See, if it's a small town, it's like one of these southern novels. Small town, whole towns, 100, 200, 300, 500 families, 600 families all together. Nobody's around. You just do it. You know what I'm saying? Like you say, you take the 50 girls and men and old thing, and you rape them and you burn them and you kill them and this and the other, and then it's all over. There's nobody left. 
and nobody can accuse you of anything because you killed everybody. This is the svara of the genocide. You kill them all, nobody can, can say anything to you. You've got to kill them all, though. And then you take their houses and you take all their possessions and all this kind of stuff, and life goes on. That's how it was. What about a bigger city where there's more of a public over there? Well, the capital city was Kovno, Kaunas. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, as you see over there, starting on June 25, again, it's before the German army showed up, Nazi organized units, not exactly true. It means the LAF that had had their headquarters in Germany attacked Jewish civilians in Slovakia. William Pope, most of you have never been in Lithuania, but I have. Uh, Kovno Countess is a town, as a city, and it's divided by a river with a bridge. When you cross the bridge, you come into the next uh, suburb, and that's Kovno, William Pope. So uh, that's where the Slovakia yeshiva is located. So the Jewish suburb of Kaunas that hosted the famous yeshiva, according to Rabbi Oshri, there were Germans present on the bridge, but it was the Lithuanians who killed the Jews. The rabbi of Slobodka, Rabbi Asovsky, whose picture you see over there, was tied hand and foot to a chair, and then his head was laid on an open gemara, and they sawed his head off. After which they murdered his wife and son. His head was then placed in the window of the residence, okay, bearing a sign, this is what we'll do to all the Jews. This the Lithuanians did it, not the Germans. Okay, let's go to the next one. As you see, they didn't stop there. Lithuanians went from house to house, searching for Jews. Their victims were thrown into the river. Those who didn't drown were shot to death as they were swimming. Jewish houses were set afire, and their occupants were burned alive as the partisans blocked the uh, fire trucks. Freedom fighters, so-called, slaughtered Jews indiscriminately. Limbs were torn off bodies and scattered hither and yon. These were Lithuanians, not the Germans. Okay, let's go next one. There's a famous scene at a public garage, like you'd say today, in the middle of downtown. Middle of downtown. And this is a German testifying to this. A German. He says, I arrived on June 27, when German army was still coming in. The Germans didn't do this, the Lithuanians did this. While patrolling the city, I came across a crowd of people. This is in the middle of downtown. That had gathered along a gas station to watch what was happening in the adjacent yard. It's a big crowd watching the massacre. There were women in the crowd, and many of them clambered on the chairs and crates so that they and their kids could get a better view of the killing, the spectacle taking place in the yard next door. Do you know what I'm saying? Right? Can't see well, so people get chairs and climb up so they can see the murder. At first, I thought it was a victory celebration or a sporting event because of the cheering, the clapping, and the laughter that kept breaking out. However, I asked what was happening, and I was told the death dealer of Kovna. In other words, death dealer means the killer, right? The guy who kills. The killer of Kovna is at work. And he would make sure that all traitors and collaborators received a fitting punishment for their treachery. When I drew closer, I witnessed a display of brutality that was unparalleled by anything I saw in combat during the two world wars. Whoa, this is a German officer saying what the Lithuanians did was brutal? Whoa, what's the expression? Pot calling the kettle black? Go on. Here's the hero. That's the guy. And what he did was he has this uh, metal pole and he went around. You can see on the right hand side. He's just whacking the, as the blood flows out of the heads. And he killed a whole bunch of people. And look at the crowd watching. right? And nobody's doing anything. Okay? And what are the property and, pro and possessions of the dead? They're all obviously seized by their neighbors. Now, I want to be clear about this. This is unbelievable. There were good people. A few good persons protested. A few. Let's go to the next one. This is important. The first recorded action of the German Einsatz group when the Germans started shooting people was in June 22, which means the day they invaded, when they went in border town called Gortz, which is only 11 miles from the border. 800 Jews were shot in the massacre. 100 non-Jewish Lithuanians were executed for trying to aid the Jews. So that's interesting. Right? That's interesting. About 80,000 Jews were killed and so on and so forth. So if you're a Lithuanian and you don't like what you're seeing, and you look around your neighbors, maybe just keep your mouth shut because you don't get hurt yourself. On the other hand, the vast majority of is, is standing and clapping and raising their ch kids on their shoulders over the fence to get a better view. You see what I'm talking about when I talk about Lithuanians and Jews and turning into heart. Um, many more Lithuanians simply went to their Jewish acquaintances and took whatever they wanted from them because what are you going to do? It's a half-girl world. 
I like your sock. I like your watches. I like your t your radio. I want like I want your silverware. I want your dresses. I want everything. What can they do? What can they do? Now there are a lot more details, but I'm not going to go into them because you get the idea. And by the time you're watching, it's probably going to tissue up anyway. And so, if you're interested in the subject, you can go online and you can see all the gruesome uh, details. Then the Germans showed up. You see my point? Everything I just talked about was perpetrated by the Lithuanians before the Germans came. It soon became clear that the Lithuanians had wasted their time because the Germans were planning to kill all the Jews anyway. You didn't have to do any of it. Had the Lithuanians known this, I imagine today from a cynical perspective, they would have sat back and said, oh, we were horrified when the Germans shot everybody, but they didn't do that. It also soon became clear that the Lithuanians had misjudged the Germans. The Germans had no intention of allowing even a puppet state. This is famous as one of Hitler's big mistakes in the Eastern Campaign. This is part of Hitler's racialism that was self-defeating. If he would have been smart in an evil way, he would have said, I'm going to back all these countries, like the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, the Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, and all that. I'll let them set up their puppet states under me. They will be a big buffer against Stalin. They will fight like hell against the Russians because they hate them. They hate them. Hate the communists with a passion. They'll kill all the Jews anyway for me. And everybody will be happy. But Hitler had this uh, whole set of philosophy and ideologies in which he said, you know, um, how should I put it? Most of the white race has to be exterminated. Isn't that funny? He's thought today by the neo-Nazis an apostle of the white race. But actually, let's go to the next one. There's Hitler with Alfred Rosenberg, who was a German, obviously not Jewish. He had weird racialist ideas. You have to understand. Hitler wants to kill the Jews, and they're white. Then he wants to kill the Slavs, like the Poles and the others, they're white. Then he wants to kill other groups, like the, eventually, who knows what, the Lithuanians, whatever, and they're white. You follow? It's not about white versus black. It's about Germans versus any other white and call the Hummer against the blacks and the Asians. So this is the funny, weird, racialist ideas that went on in Hitler's mind and the people like Rosenberg here, who was his uh, philosopher, and um, Lithuanians didn't fit into this. My point is, had Hitler won the war and triumphed, he would have killed everybody in Eastern Europe, eventually. That's the logic of it. The logic of genocide is very simple. If I kill you, I'm not going to worry about you. So you're occupying a country. If it's only 2 million people, if we kill the 2 million people, then all that land is ours. We don't have to worry about it at all. You see? I can knock off the Lithuanians, the Latvians, the Estonians, and at the best case scenario, I can convert the Lithuanians into Germans. In words, we'll, we'll, we'll kill a bunch, and the others will sort of like brainwash to learn German and become part of German people. Something, something like that. That'd be the best scenario. Uh, for the Slavs, not even that. They'll be slaves, they'll be worked to death, and as they say before, it's the, it's, the, uh, it's the philosophy of the exterminator. The exterminator says, I guess, I'll get rid of all the mosquitoes. I'll get rid of all the cockroaches. I'll get rid of all the bugs. You want to, you'll have a great house. You don't have to worry about a single rodent or anything like that. So you just apply that to human beings. So you have a great country. You won't have any of these undesirable parts. I'll be the only one left, me and my people. And they didn't understand that. So the Lithuanians, the Latvians, the Estonians, the Belarusians, the Ukrainians, it all planned on fitting in to a German-dominant Eastern Europe. They all agreed, after all, in hating the Russians. They all agreed on killing all the communists. They all agreed on killing all the Jews. But that's all. They didn't realize what a weirdo Hitler was. They didn't understand that if Hitler wins, they are genocidally, uh, what's the right word, you know, doomed. By the way, let's go to the next one. Stalin didn't think that way. He killed tens of millions of people. Race was not a thing with him. He didn't have that philosophy. He had a class thing. If you were middle class, you're high of Misa. It wasn't a question of what skin color or what race you are. It's, it's just, that's not the Marxist way. It's just interesting, you know. Anyway, without going into the details, the Germans took over the country, enslaved the Lithuanians, took from them the goods stolen from the Jews. You know what I said? All the stuff they took in that week or two, the Germans eventually confiscated, and began to populate the country with German racial halutin. Hitler moved 20, 30,000 Germans in, and the idea was clear. This, part, this place is going to be part of Germany. You understand? Had Germany won, Lithuania would have been doomed, and certainly their culture, which would have served them right. Let's go to the next one. Because they say when you sup with the devil, you have to have a long spoon. If you, if you get in bed with Hitler, do not be surprised at what happens to you. One thing, though, the Germans and Lithuanians, with exceptions, one thing they agreed on was kill all the Jews. All of them. 
And now for the next six months, between June and December of 41, the Germans and Lithuanians teamed up to shoot all the Jews in the country. That's it in a nutshell. Okay? Um, this is the famous, what they call the uh, Holocaust by bullets. That's the term used now. In other words, I'm talking about killing people, which was all over Eastern Europe at this time, but I'm concentrating in this talk on Lithuania. The idea was that before they even established Auschwitz and such places, and before they invented extermination camps with gas chambers, the old-fashioned way, you just round everybody up and shoot them. And therefore, Hitler had these Einsatzgruppen, which were special uh, detachments. And what they did in Lithuania was simple. Let's say I'm the head of an Einsatzgruppe. I go to a town. It's got so and so many Jews. I call a meeting of all the Lithuanians. I say, look here. We all want to agree we want to get rid of Jews. Who wants to help? Anybody got a gun? Want to have a good time? Who wants to help? We'll get rid of these guys. And everybody will get 10 bucks or 100 bucks, whatever. You know? And all of a sudden, people raise their hands. You got a gun? I got, I'll bring my own gun. I need bullets. I'll get you the bullets, the German guy says. They'll do this. Then we got organizers. We're talking about 1,000 Jews here, or 500, 800, or whatever. You know, those kind of numbers. I mean, so and so many trucks. Where's the place? Lithuania said, well, I'll show you a good spot. There's a big hole. We can dig a big hole. German checks it. I said, no, it's not good because of the sand. Well, what about over here? Lithuania says, well, how about this guy's farm in the back? Pay him some money, and we can use that that land, riverbed or something like that. German said, okay, it's a good idea. So how many guys are into this? And all the good old boys say, we're, we're, we're in Canterson, we're bringing our own guns, or you give us guns or something like that. I think they had their own guns. You know, and uh, that's a cooperation. Notice the Germans aren't doing the shooting. The Germans are doing the organizing. The Germans are there with their guns, but the Lithuanians are doing the work. Lithuanians are glad to do it. They take the Jews who are totally helpless. They round them up however they do sometimes in small batches, sometimes all at once. They take them out to that place. Either they walk them out or they drive them in trucks. They make them dig a hole. And then they shoot them. Okay? It's as simple as that. Let's go to the next uh, uh, slide. One after another. There are plenty of... Sh uh, there you go. These are happening in Lithuania. Now, they killed everybody in Lithuania just about. In six months. In six months. It's, it's simple, right? You dig a hole. You see right in front of you the pictures. Right? This is why they call the Holocaust by bullets. Who are the shooters? The Germans did some, no question about it. The Lithuanians did most, as far as we know. Okay? And what I mean to say is like this. They don't agree on what the future of Lithuania is, but they agree they don't want any juice. And Lithuanians are happy to be the ones to pull the trigger. They're just happy to do it. This is what is different between Lithuania and Poland that I discussed two, two years ago in the summer, two or three years ago. The Poles, for a whole bunch of reasons, didn't do this. Lithuanians did. Okay? They're active participants and perpetrators of the Holocaust uh, under German supervision, German help, but they would have done it on their own. That's the point of all this. Okay? And the result is horror. Horror. Go to the next one. Here's a typical case where they burn people down. They put them in a shoal, one of those old fashioned wooden synagogues, and burn it down. Mama's like it says in Tehillim, Hom Arei Soba, right? What the Edomites do, tear it down to its very foundations. Burn down the synagogues and burn the people inside of them. And you know what they do. Let me put it this way. The lucky ones were not killed or, um, excuse me, the lucky ones were not tortured or raped or whatever along the way. They were just taken out and shot. That's the lucky ones. The unlucky ones were tortured in various ways before they were shot. Better if I get shot in the end or burned alive or burned alive. Uh, I want to be very clear about this. Let's go to the next one. Lithuanians, these are Lithuanians. They shoot women. Children, you see the pictures in front of you. That's a bunch of girls on the upper hand side. That's a bunch of ladies, including an old lady in the lower left hand side. That's a bunch of children, boys, in the upper right hand side. They're taking a bunch of boys. As you see, they took their pants off, whatever, and they're going to shoot them. Right? In the lower right hand side, it's regular adults. This is Shavel where my father lived. They put a bunch of people in the truck. Look at those Jewish guys in the truck and look at the Gentile standing next to him. He's the Lithuanian. He's got a, a rifle in his hand. You know what's happening. Okay? And if you're talking about June, July, especially July, August, September, October, November, December, that's when all this happened. And usually, most of it happened in July, August, September. Okay? That's when whole communities were just shot. Okay? And what's the result? Let's go to the next one. They killed everybody. Out of 250,000, 15,000 survived. The Holocaust in Lithuania, as you see, resulted in near, it's just off the internet, resulted in near, near total 
destruction of Litvaks and Polish Jews living in the area of Lithuania, and so forth, out of 100, 200, 800, 210,000, really the number's a little higher, uh, about 195,000 were murdered before the end of World War II, most between June and December of 41. Honestly, the numbers are higher than this. It's like 200 and some thousand, but I know, I'm not going to you know, quibble about that. So the vast majority of these 200 and whatever thousand are shot in the six months between June and December of 41. Okay? More than 95%, the keyboard is more, more than 95% of Lithuania's Jewish po uh, population was massacred over three year German occupation. In other words, 41, 42, 43, and into 44. So June of 41 to June of 42, June of 42 to June of 43, June of 43 to June of 44, by then the Russians show up. More than 95% of Lithuania's Jewish population was massacred over the three-year German occupation, a more complete destruction than befell any other country affected by the Holocaust. Historians attribute this to the massive collaboration in the genocide by the non-Jewish local paramilitaries. I like that word. They're just going to town to say, let's get some good old boys over here. So the reasons for this collaboration are debated. No, they're not. I mean, now they're debated for the political correct Lithuanians, you know. You want to understand very clearly why this is happening. Now, by the way, Lithuanians were so good at what they did, the Germans formed them in special detachments and used them all over Eastern Europe, like in Auschwitz and places like that. Many of the guards and the concentration camps and the extermination camps were Lithuanians. Also Latvians, also Estonians. But I'm talking, as I say, in this uh, mini-series, I'm speaking about Lithuanians. Right? This is just what happened in World War II. Now, of the very few that were left alive, because if they're shooting these kind of numbers, how many left alive? Of the Jews who were not shot, three long-term ghettos were set up. By that I mean, that if you want to get technical about it, in July of 41, all over Lithuania, wherever the Jewish communities, they set up these little ghettos. But they only lasted a month or, or less, or two months, because then they shot everybody. There were three places where there were long-term ghettos. One was Vilna, one was Kovna, one was Shavu. As you see, on the, Vilna is on the lower right-hand side, I guess. Supposed to be the capital country. Count us in the middle more. Do you see that? And uh, towards the, roughly around the belly button. And Shaolai, Shaolai all the way in the north. That's where my father lived. I'm only here today because he happened to live in one of the places where they didn't kill everybody overnight. In most of the places. I remember when I was a kid, my father told me, so when I was young, I dated this girl. And for a while, it looked like we were going to get married. And she lived in a certain town. And in the end, it fell through. And if I would have lived in that town... I would have been killed in 1941 because they just came and shot everybody one, two, three. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You had to be in one of these three communities and then you underwent torture. All right? Because then, if you lived in, if you lived from June of 42, I'm sorry, of June of 41 to June of 44, it was three years. If you lived then in Vilna, Shavl, and Kovna, then, let's go to the next one, you were slave labor. Avodim Monino Lefar Mitzrayim, Beres Lita. As it says in the Torah, they made their lives bitter in brick and mortar and all kinds of work in the fields. The Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. That's what happened. I know this from my own family. So, for example, my father was in Shavu. One of the reasons they needed special work detachment is Shavu, you're going to be surprised to hear this, has a world class airport. It's one of the largest airports in the world. <laughs> Hard to think of it that way. And um, it was a big military air base. And Germans always expanding it. And they needed slave labor to build junk for the Air Force. And I found out these memoirs that Bill Sachs was trying to help me recover from the tape recorder, unsuccessfully, unfortunately. And um, I remember he said in Yiddish that, uh, you know, they had to hold these heavy bricks. And a lot of it literally was Avodas para. The stuff they had to uh, schlep uh, really broke people's backs. In other words, people died carrying these heavy loads. And Germans didn't give a darn. And so basically... Um, the few who were left alive were net because the German war economy demanded slave labor. Had things going on and the Germans won, they would have just shot these people or worked them to death. Um, all throughout this period of June of 41 to June of 44, there were these horrible uh, sadistic actions, as they call them, actions, where the Germans just run into the ghetto and round up and say, give us your kids. Or give us a, your, everybody, give me your second child. That's how they did it, you know. Everybody, give me your oldest child. They tell the Jewish community, you have to hand over so and so many people. I want all the people who are 65 and older to show up in this and this place. Uh, you know, these are called the axions. They would hang people 
for fun on Jewish holidays. Now it's coming up. Tisha B'Av, oh boy, a special hangings on Tisha B'Av, on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. Uh, burning down hospitals with everybody inside it. They like to do that. That's what they did in Kovna. That's how the famous Mashkiach of the Slovak Yeshiva, Krasinski, uh, was, was killed. Uh, just burned the whole place down. And on and on and on, you know. In other words, there are plenty of gruesome stories, which I'm not into today. Why? Because they were perpetrated by the Germans on the Lithuanian Jews. That's not what I'm talking about today. As I said before, if I wanted to go into a chronicle of suffering, of the Jews and the, the surviving Jews from the original massacres, from June of 41 to June of 44, uh, at the hands of the Germans, uh, that's a separate series. Okay? I don't think people would like it. If you're interested in the subject whatsoever, in a classic Jewish sense, let's go to the next one. I'm talking about the horror is perpetrated by the Germans, not the Lithuanians. It's told graphically and poignantly in the famous uh, collection of the Shalos and Shubas from Rabbi Oshri, who somehow or other survived in the Covenant Ghetto. A few survived. And there's all these stories, you know what I mean? Let's go to the next one. These are two nice ones. I, didn't want, I want to spare you the horror one. I, want to, I didn't want to give you the Sophie's Choice kind of uh, Shilas that they had. But uh, very briefly, Psikosov, a ghetto, Zeman, Ravoshvi, Shel, so she read the situation in ghetto, unusual questions. No sims here. Random shown mage mushroom like this kachle dugma. For example, nisham can't be bebrichas hashacha shalos neivet. I just described you backbreaking labor, and so from Jew writes him. He says, "Do I make a bracha in the morning shalos neivet?" And God did not make an evet. I am an evet. We keep shatzar mustir al matzav yuvi ghetto because all the Jews were doing harsh physical labor like they did in Egypt. It's not an exaggeration. But she was a kozer of Ashri, and he tried to say. It's a spiritual slavery. You're not spiritually enslaved. You're only physically enslaved. It's like the note of Yehuda on the Haggadah Shal Pesach. An evid is a state of mind. You're an evid physically, no question about it. We should recite the Bracha Shalom on the Yavid to keep our human dignity. Right? It shows that we still consider ourselves free people, and we hope for an end to this. And you know, here's another one I thought you'd be interested in. There were some Lithuanians who acted uh, heroically, some, not many, and saved Jews and things like that. And a person said like this, there was a certain person who was not Jewish that saved my life. Should I say Kaddish for this person who's not Jewish? Because he or she, I forget the case, uh, you know, was a was a, was a righteous gentile, and Rosh Kodesh a double inu rak muter al chovim musari, and he says it's a mitzvah to say Kaddish for this person who's not Jewish, after they risked your life in this hell, on behalf of, of the Jew. So I'm just two of the uh, remarkable, less bloody questions that are the plethora of them in these uh, literature. So these are what I call pathetic childless. By 1943, the Jews were all dead basically. But the Lithuanians had not inherited a paradise. They were suffering under a German occupation. And by 1943, after Stalingrad, and certainly after the Battle of Kursk in July 43, it was clear to everybody, slowly but surely, Stalin is coming back. Hoping against hope for help from the West. The Lithuanians may have wondered whether they had acted wisely. (laughs) Because when do you expect help from America after you shot all the Jews and were such collaborators with Hitler. By 1944, the Red Army is on the way back. The Germans on the Eastern Front are suffering defeat after defeat in order that the Russians should not find any Jews at all when they come to Lithuania. The ghettos, the three ghettos, Shavl, Kovna, Vilna, were liquidated. Notice the few people left alive uh, were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. Stutthof concentration camp. Mainly, that's near Danzig. It's not far away from the Lithuanian border. This is one of those horrible concentration camps that people have never heard of. Shudov is actually the place where they had lampshades from human skin. They had the first gas chambers there as torture things. And again, my father, one of the rare cases, was not killed in the six months of 41 and survived somehow or other under the terrible conditions in the ghetto in 41, 42, 43 with his wife and, and, and child. But 
in June of 44, with the Russians coming close, the Germans arrest everybody still alive and send them on a train to Stodov concentration camp. There, uh, since my father was still able-bodied, I don't know how, see, he was sent to Dachau to, 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 as laborer, you understand, the concentration camp on the other side of Germany, on the Western Front, in Bavaria. Uh, his wife and child uh, remained in Stutthof, and then the Germans gave him a phenol in the heart, and then they put the guy from heart attack. In other words, even at the very end, the Russians are already there, Germans were still killing Lithuanian Jews. By the time the Soviets returned in mid-44, so they liberated Lithuania fairly early in mid-44, there are very few Jews left to rejoice, but rejoice they do. Because Stalin has freed them. It's funny. Stalin was a monster to many people. But for the Lithuanian Jews, the few who survived, the Red Army saved them. It's a fact. That's why Hitler honored Putin not long ago when he came to the Yad Vashem. It's a crazy world out there. Right? Lithuanians are angry. Why do they honor Putin and all the rest of it? Eh, really? The Russians saved us. You guys killed us. Okay. The Lithuanian neighbors are beyond horrified. The Russians are back. The war, is, as far as they're concerned, has ended horrifically. We are Americans. We're Westerners. We say World War I ended with the good guys winning. Not for Lithuania. The big guys won. Lithuania had become a ghost town for the Jews. Imagine somebody who, one way or another, survived and comes back to his town, his village, and there literally is nobody left. And if he knows what he, if he's smart, has half a brain, he won't come back to that village because they'll kill you. Right? The whole shot is they don't want any survivors. They don't want any witnesses. And so the smart person just will get out of there. All that's left is a memory. And now what? The Lithuanians were about to face the wrath of Stalin. But the few Jews left alive couldn't care less. Why should they care? This will bring us to our next talk. With that, I hope everybody have an easy fast. And I wish you a good night.